Hi, I'm Brad, and I'm watching this space. It's been a couple weeks since Apple came out and decided that it is now the era of spatial computing. And while I do not believe that this spatial computing concept that was actually first majorly coined by Magic Leap and now adopted by Apple is not going to be extremely mainstream for probably five or so years, I do think that, yes, this is something that you should pay attention to and that there's a lot of benefits and a lot of pluses to just thinking about how we can just take this sort of concept of doing everything that we do with uh, desktop computers or laptops and bringing it into our 3D spaces around us or in the virtual world. And every time there's a new hype cycle coming from a rebranding of VR AR, such as the metaverse or spatial computing, I'm always keeping a close eye on things that are trying to ride the hype wave or kind of see things that I think are being done wrong to ride the hype wave and things that could be done better or the way things I would do it if I was in a position of power. So this video is sort of an editorial piece of all the different things I've done related to the spatial computing concept and things I've seen that I think should be done differently based on all the experiments I've done and things that I just, again, would like to see. And I think it'll be a really interesting video. So first off, I want to declare the elephant in the room. Apple's spatial computing device is an all-in-one package. Like the dev kit just came out, uh, or I should say the SDK. Um, there's a lot of great information of how they want everything to be done, how everything is going to be integrated, how many apps are going to launch day one. There's a ton of information already on the Apple headset. And everything I've seen about it, I don't actually think that other companies are going to be able to pull this off as well as Apple because of the power they have with their custom silicon and their, their just extremely closed down ecosystem. While it's bad in some ways, for that device, it's going to benefit them greatly. That Again, I just don't see how other companies are going to be able to match at the same level. So I've been thinking about how things could sort of progress if you do not have the superpower of this extreme ecosystem that Apple has a hold of. And it kind of goes back to this device that you might remember I did a pretty uh, somewhat harsh review last year. And this device has changed somewhat in notable ways since then. It's not a device I recommend as a sort of productivity or spatial computing device. I don't think anyone really says that at all about the device. This is a device that I think is good best for PC VR. And I've been using this device this week quite a lot with this device. This is an ROG Ally. Now, I'm not going to say that the ROG Ally is powerful enough or really designed software-wise to provide a extreme PC VR standalone experience, but I got some really great experiments out of it that made me very confident that we are very close to the idea of an x86 AMD or, or whatever APU being able to power VR if it had all the uh, software and platform tweaks going on inside of it. Basically, the best way to think about these devices working together is this XR2 chip in here is kind of like the R1 in the Apple, and the actual AMD APU in here is kind of like the M2 in the Apple. Very simplified explanation, but that's kind of how I was going with all these experiments. Now, to prove out an entirely mobile concept, I actually made this APU only run at 15 watts for most of my tests. Uh, most sort of APUs or SOCs inside of these headsets do run around that 15 watts range. And while this thing can go up to 30 watts plugged in, again, I just wanted to prove out a sort of portability use case and see how things can do with the current software situation. So the software I used the most between these two uh, devices was Virtual Desktop. I found it to be the most best example I can do for split compute because I can do stuff such as the Snapdragon's built-in uh, upscaling, which allows you to do the render resolution of VR on the APU to be at lower, and then the actual XR2 chip in the headset can upscale that to be better. So there, there's a lot of like handhelding going on there to get a better experience that reaches your eyes. And I always found Virtual Desktop had to be the best when it comes to all those little features that you can turn on, tweak, or turn off. It was just really useful to have all that. The good news is I was actually quite impressed with the sort of uh, performance I was getting out of a lot of these different things. Now, again, this is not something that the ROG Ally was designed for, the APU was designed for, not to run at 15 watts or to run VR. Um, all the Windows software, all the SteamVR software, it's not designed for this purpose. 
but I was still able to get like at least 45 frames per second in most sort of the heavier games if I can set all the graphics settings to low, for example. And I could do a lot of stuff with the space warp on the actual device to reproject that to either 90 or if I'm running at lower, like 72 hertz on the actual HMD, I could reach that pretty comfortably and do a lot of playable things such as this workshop mod, which is the pinnacle of PC VR, is being able to just do stuff off of uh, mods and workshops without any problems. Just download, click, and play. And going back to how the XR2 is like the R1, if you think about how the mixed reality is all running on the XR2 chip, so none of that camera processing that has to actually be done on the APU and the ROG Ally, I was even able to do stuff such as uh, key out a alpha for a certain VR chat world so I can actually put my friends from VR chat in my live room. So again, the actual Quest Pro is doing all the actual camera processing stuff, but the APU and the ROG Ally is actually doing all the rendering from VR chat and all the avatars, which was a fantastic demo and things just worked perfectly for that. I should note for that exact demo I just said, you do need a program called ALXR because that runs on OpenXR and allows you to access the cameras to do this live keying. That was not a virtual desktop thing. Both worked really well, just for different reasons. But as I was doing these tests, I realized a lot of problems with the software and really just a lot of problems with the uh, lack of capabilities I can in terms of pairing these two devices together. And the biggest one was relying on wireless. So the two big problems there were one, uh, I really wish that I could connect the Quest Pro directly to this thing with a hotspot, but Windows hotspot features are known to be notoriously bad and every time that I would be able to try to connect the Quest Pro to this ROG Allies hotspot, performance was terrible. Like, uh, I would get to like 200 milliseconds of latency no matter what I did. So I would always have to rely on either uh, plugging these two directly to my main router at my home, getting a lot of latency from that, and it, it's just not ideal. I wish that these devices, if they were going to work wirelessly, allow you to actually connect directly to each other. It, it makes the most sense. Now, even when connecting to each other wirelessly, you have to rely on encoding and decoding, for example. And I noticed that a lot of my latency from these uh, experiments were not really the game rendering. Now, some games did have a lot of latency from just the, the lack of rendering that the APU in this thing was running at, but the actual decoding and encoding was a huge task uh, constantly that is required when you're doing any sort of uh, wireless link or even wired link. I, I did plug the Quest Pro into my ROG Ally and ran the wired Oculus Link. And again there, the biggest latency I was getting for all my charts was just the fact that the APU and the XR2 just had to do a lot of encoding and decoding back and forth, which wouldn't be as necessary if these devices had something like the, uh, the, the, the DisplayPort Alt mode where you don't have to rely on compressing a signal and sending it over a wired USB 3 or a wireless link. So wired is still very important and getting get to an insane amount of importance to based on what kind of wired standards you even have. Now, as resolutions increase, you naturally just need more bandwidth to throw at things and you need better decoders, better encoders, better solutions to do this. But even with wired, you do have limits that I wish were being uh, expressed quite a bit. So the big screen beyond is notoriously known at this point to be running at 2560 by 2560 per eye at 75 hertz. But when you run at 90 hertz, things get a little uh, less clear due to some, some weird stuff they're going on with the software because I think there's limitations to the display trip uh, running in this thing. And a lot of that stuff, even with DSC involved, uh, I do think we need stuff such as DisplayPort 2.0 because running this thing with a uh, 90 hertz mode, text such as on monitors or digital desktops, look, uh, you can see the compression in text more than anything, which is the most important thing to do if you're doing anything related to spatial computing or productivity. Now, when you set it down to 75 hertz, it actually works pretty well. So you can, you're, you're getting close to that acceptable barrier of being able to do productivity in these devices, but even with wires, you're hitting these limits that still need to improve. This leads me to a product that I think is doing all the right things that I would like to see out of sort of an open uh, spatial computing combo device. However, I think they're doing a lot of things wrong and, and, and sort of their implementation of it doesn't really make sense in the long run for consumers. So there's this device called the Sightful Space Top. 
Uh, basically what they did is they chopped off the screen and, and did this whole laptop sort of shell casing on the bottom with the full keyboard, trackpad, and even a camera that looks at you and probably could be used for a web camera if you really needed that. Um, however, instead of allowing you to plug in any sort of headset or any sort of uh, device such as a VR, or MR, spatial computing thing, they hardwired a, a pair of Nreal or now called Xreal glasses, which I think they were going for the idea that it's useful to be seen with this in public, like glasses are more a notable form factor. But at the end of the day, when you are doing these productivity things, I really think when you're moving your head around, you need a large FOV if you actually want to look at multiple screens and be productive. Otherwise, chopping off the top end of the monitor that is usually attached to a laptop, you probably get more notable uh, pixels per degree in screen real estate space than with these glasses, and these are hardwired in. And another worst case with this sort of design is the actual uh, laptop itself is running on an XR2 or eight, uh, Snapdragon 865 chip. So you lose a lot of that processing benefits you get out of having a full-on laptop. Laptops are getting to the point where they're incredibly, incredibly powerful. You can put in some great GPUs, CPUs, uh, SOCs in there. And then if you can pair that uh, with the idea of such as a headset that also can kind of funnel in their compute on their own and do some sort of split compute task, I think you have a really good spatial computing device. So I would like to see something like this, but maybe even with an x86 sort of a Linux system that runs entirely with a headset or with that whatever headset that you have that sort of fits these standards, because I don't think that this device makes sense because most devices such as the Quest Pro, for example, already run on the XR2 chip, and you can't really do much on it, on it by itself for productivity. You usually have to connect it to another device that has all your productivity tools on there. And I know that might be, for some people, a it's just a matter of time thing, but I think most people are just comfortable in this early age of spatial computing to use the devices that they're normally uh, doing stuff anyway, and that has all their software and all their plugins, everything that they're able to run day one. That being said, I am very excited to see how this spatial computing craze uh, evolves and how things get better and improve and, and all these things. I think it's a very interesting time to be alive, um, which is kind of a joke to say in itself, but it really is an interesting paradigm shift for computing, and I want to cover it as much as I can for the future, and these are just some small glimpses you're getting now of what I think could happen in the near future. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, it was a bit of a ranty video, but it was something that was really on my mind that I had, I had to get off from all my experiments and learnings from the past uh, couple months of doing different things related to productivity or looking at text and stuff and of your headset constantly. And I just think things are getting eerily close to being useful, but there's still things that were just mm, not there, not there. So yeah, bye.